Good day, everyone. My name is David Williams, Executive Director of the United States Association for Energy Economics. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar entitled USAE's Young Professional Best Paper Award Competition. We're grateful to our moderator, Dr. Lucy Hsu from the University of Maryland, and our young professional as well as our uh, as, uh, as well as our distinguished panelists to evaluate the presentations today. First, a little bit about the United States Association for Energy Economics. We are the largest affiliate of the International Association for Energy Economics and provide a forum for the exchange of experiences, ideas, and issues among professionals interested in the field. The organization produces two professional journals, a newsletter, and holds conferences and virtual presentations along with a host of other products and services that you can find at our website at www.usae.org. If you're not already a member of the association, we welcome you to join. A few housekeeping matters in regard to today's webinar before I hand things over to our moderator. First, this webinar is being recorded for those that cannot participate in today's live event. If you have questions for our students and young professionals, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. We've allocated sufficient time at the end of this webinar to address your questions. And now I would like to introduce you to our moderator, Dr. Lucy Hsu, Associate Professor in the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland College Park. Lucy, over to you. Great. Thanks, Dave. And uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our first USAE Young Professional Best Paper Award. I'm very glad that I got a chance to co-organize this uh, event with uh, Anna Albert uh, Bro, uh, who is a technician, uh, who is a senior economist at the uh, Chacha Tech uh, company. So just to remind you what this uh, competition is about, uh, the competition is open for young uh, 35 years of age and below energy economists working in academia, industry, government, and other organizations. The research papers were solicited in the summer and have undergone initial evaluation by the judges. And after the event, uh, the judges will select the winner of the best, uh, best paper award among the competitors, although uh, all presenters are recognized for the high quality of their work by being selected into the final computation among all the submissions. All right, and then before I introduce all four finalists, uh, let me first introduce our distinguished judges. Yeah. Uh, our first judge uh, is Dawood Ansari, uh, who is a researcher at the German Institute for Economic Research, DIW Berlin, and director and co-founder at the Energy Access and Development Program. And then our next judge and also co-organizer of the event is Anna ebers uh, Bro, uh, who is a, a, a renewable energy economist at engineering consulting firm, Tetra Tech. And our next judge is Nathalie Hinchi, who is an associate at the Brado Group at Economic and Litigation Consulting Firm. And our last judge is Kiara Lopriti, who is associate professor of energy economics at the Penn State University. All right, and then we have uh, four finalists that enter into the final computation. And then each finalist will have 12 minutes to present their work. And then after the, each present their work, our judges will uh, be asking them questions. And also our attendees, you're welcome to uh, type your answers into uh, the Zoom uh, webinar and I will be able to select your questions uh, if uh, we have enough time uh, to ask the questions. All right, so without further ado, let me first introduce our, our first finalist, Sylvia Bilak. Uh, Sylvia Bilak uh, uh, works as an economist at the Institute for Policy Integrity at New York University studying the efficacy of environmental policies. And recently, her focus has been on environmental policies in the context of electricity market design and regulation, in particular in connection to capacity markets. All right, and then her uh, paper today is Efficiency in Wholesale Electricity Markets on the Role of Externalities and Subsidies. All right, Sylvia, uh, you can share your screen now and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, here we go. Um, so first of all, oh, oh, let me start my time. First of all, thank you so much for the honor of being here today and presenting um, to all of you. The paper I submitted for the competition um, deals with the effect of subsidies uh, given to wholesale market resources. And the paper is co-authored with um, my colleague, Bertrand Yunel, 
Today, I will focus on one of the aspects of the papers that relates to the current policy developments. Um, and um, as you probably know, um, in the Northeast of the US, there, have been, um, there has been a series of capacity market reforms that aimed to mitigate the effect of subsidies on those capacity markets. Their reforms have different names. Um, in PJM, they are known as MOPR reforms. In ISO New England, it was the CASPER uh, proceeding. In NISO, this is the buyer side mitigation. So different names, also different details of the reform, but the justification for them, um, their mechanisms, and also the effects are similar. And namely, all those reforms are going to prevent some of the clean generators from clearing the capacity market. And given the goals of decarbonization, um, such reforms might seem counterproductive. On the other hand, though, maybe those reforms are a um, signal that subsidies given to clean generation are very distortive to the market and that something has to be done about them. And so this presentation in the paper is an attempt at using economic theory and economic modeling to understand the effects of subsidies, but also to understand the justification for the capacity market reforms and the impacts of those reforms. So uh, the reason for why we are talking about it in the first place is that electricity sector is one of the main polluters. And the standard recommendation by economists in such a case would be just to introduce um, emission pricing, ideally in a form of Pigouvian taxes that would implement the first best outcomes in electricity markets and make sure those markets are working efficiently. However, the regulators um, decided to do, in a sense, the opposite. So instead of um, making polluters pay for pollution, they started paying non-polluting generators for their generation and by introducing subsidies. Particularly many subsidies pay generators for each megawatt hour of energy that they feed into the grid that is clean. And um, I will refer to those type of subsidies as generation subsidies, and I will focus on them today. Those generation subsidies policies are immensely popular. Uh, International Energy Agency identified over 440 of such policies, and I believe it's an undercount. Um, in the US, there, is, there are plenty of them. I listed a few. And um, one of the most prominent examples is the re renewable portfolio standards. Um, yes, so I believe that given the popularity of those subsidies, it's really important that we understand their effects, um, how they interact with, uh, with a wholesale electricity market, how they change prices, resource mix, and of course, uh, the efficiency. And, uh, I want to compare those subsidies to the first best outcomes of Peruvian taxes, but I think it's also important to know how the subsidies change um, the outcomes compared to what I call status quo. So the current situation in the electricity market where basically externalities are not internalized. And evaluation of the subsidy is of course incremental, uh, instrumental to the bigger question of how to assess the recent capacity market reforms. To answer those questions, I derive a simple model of electricity sector, uh, taking the JOSCO and Tirol 2007 paper as a starting point. Just to give you a feeling for the model, I will talk shortly about the main ingredients for it. And um, so first, I reflect the fluctuating demand for electricity through implementing um, N separate electricity demand curves that are ranked in the order of increasing demand. I also have the heterogeneity of resources by having a set of M possible generation technologies. The, each technology has its own investment costs, marginal generation costs, and marginal environmental damages. And of course, the existence of environmental damages is super relevant for me because if there are no externalities, so no emissions, then um, generation subsidies are never a good idea. Based on the possible generation uh, technologies, the model endogenously determines which technologies are actually economic and gets to be built. The other element of the uh, model is the assumption of competitive contact, 
So I will be identifying the equilibria through zero economic profit condition. And the model also allows for scarcity pricing, uh, meaning that at times the prices will soar above the marginal costs reflected in the bids of the units uh, in the market. In the model, I have two market designs. One, the, the simpler one, um, is the energy only market like we have in Arcos. And the second design is where capacity markets complement the energy markets, uh, as is the case in PJM, NISO, ISO New England, and MISO. Um, as a reminder, capacity markets are markets in which the commitment by power plants is traded to be available for generation when needed. And um, in my paper, I follow the standard assumption that electricity price caps create the need for capacity markets. So um, given those inputs, the model um, solves for equilibria in three steps. First, it solves for set of economic generators and the merit order, so basically the supply curve. Uh, in the second step, um, it obtains the equilibrium equ energy price in, for each demand state. And in the third uh, step, I compute the equilibrium capacity of various generator types. And uh, the nice feature of the model is that it allows for closed form solutions. So it's very helpful for building up uh, intuition about what's going on in the model. Now, um, within the this framework, it is, um, it is easy to see what effects subsidies have. And so first, um, let's assume that a subsidy is given to a generation type that is marginal in demand state I. And let's assume that the subsidy is granted to uh, the resource from a general budget. Such a subsidy in equilibrium and compared to situation of now subsidy will affect only two energy prices. The price of the subsidy, uh, the price in the state when the subsidized resource is marginal and the price in lower demand state. And let me illustrate this with an example. Uh, here we have a situation where we have three demand states. There's a D1, the D2, a D2, and D3. And we also have three types of resources that are, um, that are economic, so built, uh, are built out. There's the resource type one, type two, and type three. This is our um, supply curve with the equilibrium prices P1, P2, and P3. If now I give a subsidy to resource type three, I will increase, uh, decrease its marginal cost, decreasing the P3 and increasing P2. And importantly, the price P1 will not be affected by this. On the other hand, if I were to give the subsidy to a resource type one, the only price that would be affected would be the price P1 going down. And uh, there would be no further price adjustments because there is no lower demand state. Um, we are talking here about um, energy only markets uh, for this, but of course, we also want to know under those energy only markets what capacities are built for each type of the power plant. And of course, subsidies change that. So um, the result, the finding from, from the paper is that if you give a subsidy to a um, resource type that is marginal in demand state I, you increase the capacity of this so, uh, of this demand type, uh, of this resource type, and you increase the capacity of resources that are its immediate neighbors in the merit order. So, for instance, if you were to give a subsidy to the resource type two, you would increase its capacity, but decrease the capacity of both resource type one and resource type three. On the other hand, if you were to give a subsidy to resource type three, you will increase its capacity but at the cost of the capacity of resource type two. And this is what um, those propositions state. So the, the next finding uh, is that very intuitive one, that subsidies, if we give uniform subsidies to ge clean generators, even, so even if we combine those subsidies with, with electricity consumption taxes, generally we'll not be able to reach the first best outcomes. However, even though the subsidies will not give the optimal outcome, uh, it can be shown that there exists, there always exists a range of generation subsidies 
uh, when we finance them from the general budget, that will weakly increase the efficiency of the market compared to the status quo. So I take from this that while the subsidies are not the ideal instrument, they still can be helpful for dealing with externalities um, in, the, in the electricity markets. So um, let's introduce now capacity markets into this. Um, uh, I assume now that there is a price cap that, um, um, that sets a um, ceiling on the energy prices that can be achieved and it's binding in the highest demand state. Um, the findings from economic literature are that the capacity prices in such a case are a difference between the cap value and uh, a peak price that would be achieved without the cap. Now, combine it with my findings about which prices are affected by subsidy, and you will realize that if we do not give the subsidies to the peaking resource, and if the subsidies do not change the identity of the peaking resource, then it means the subsidies will not change the capacity in market prices. And this is important because the capacity reforms in the US have been uh, based on the worry about the capacity price suppression by generation subsidies. So uh, regulators worried subsidies depress the capacity prices below competitive levels, preventing the entry. And so the reforms required subsidized resources to be higher in capacity markets um, uh, than, than we would expect them. And so this paper shows that at the current level and structure of subsidies, the, this justification is wrong because the subsidies do not actually affect the equilibrium, do not suppress the equilibrium capacity prices. And on the top of that, because the subsidies can be welfare enhancing, any policy that will, uh, any blanket policy that will just undo or try to mitigate the effect of subsidies has the potential to be welfare destroying. So yes, what I want you to, to take from this is that subs generation subsidies are not um, the optimal tool, but also they can be helpful in dealing with externalities and that ca current capacity market reform seems to miss their stated goal of increasing the efficiency of electricity markets. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sylvia. That was a great presentation. All right, so I will go first go with the questions from the uh, judges, and then I will turn to the questions from the audience. All right, so that Anna has already raised her hand. Other judges, if you have any questions, uh, please use the raise hand function. All right, Anna, your turn. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you for the presentation. So a very interesting paper and impactful, uh, big policy conclusions. Uh, let me talk about one of the central assumptions in your paper. In the conclusion sections, you argue that subsidy approach is increasing in importance. And uh, this is contrary to what I've been observing in the US, such as phasing out of wind and solar tax breaks, introduction of solar tariffs that impede trade, and so on. So, and on the other hand, with decreasing prices for renewable energy, one can argue that subsidies will become less and less relevant in the US and in other developed economies. Moreover, I'd like to note that it's a little far-fetched in my view to call an RPS a subsidy. It's a mandate. There is a big difference. One is the stick and the other one is a carrot. So what are your thoughts on this? And in addition, what are the lessons learned from your paper beyond the two US markets that you have investigated? Perhaps some international implications. Thank you. Sure. Um, yes. Um, uh, let me start with the second um, comment because it's kind of a bit easier about the RPS being mandated and not subsidy. I, I agree that technically they are, um, or on paper, they look differently, but um, our renewable portfolio standard effectively mean um, that the resources, uh, the clean resources get an additional revenue um, on over the top, on the top of what would be given to them uh, through um, wholesale markets, and so I consider them. Uh, uh, well, depending on where you are, right? For example, in New York State, um, the renewable portfolio um, there is a procurement by NYSERDA, and um, those resources receive additional um, uh, revenue um, compared to their re uh, regular in, um, income. Um, and so I totally agree with you. Once um, 
once those resources are competitive in a sense their marginal costs um, or building costs go down enough that they do not have to be subsidized um, then obviously the whole problem disappears and then I, I totally agree with you that renewable portfolio standards will just uh, become mandates that are even not binding because those resources will be built into in the market anyway um, but um, as for the big lessons um, that I learned, I think the most exciting part for me was to understand how the subsidies interact with wholesale markets and um, how they change the outcomes there. And I think the, this has implications for countries that are thinking about introducing capacity markets. So there's a lot of chatter about how the future uh, resource adequacy can work given the increasing share of renewables. Um, and I, I believe our paper just shows that subsidizing policies just has no interaction with how exactly you do the resource adequacy approach, uh, which might be encouraging for some policymakers. Does this answer your questions? Thanks. Great, thanks, Anna. Thanks, Sylvia. And then uh, next, uh, Kiara. Thank you, Lucy, and <clears throat> thank you, Sylvia, for, for the presentation. I, I enjoyed it, and I, I do think that models like the, the one that you, that you worked on give some very useful insights um, that, that can be, again, that can be useful for policymakers. Um, so <laughs> the sort of um, the downside of analytical models with solutions, with analytical solutions like the one that, that you proposed is that um, in some cases you have to make very strong assumptions. And, and one thing that I wanted to confirm with you is the fact that you did not account for transmission constraints in your, uh, in your setting. And as you know, transmission constraints may uh, have a very significant effect and they could change the price, the equilibrium price that you find. And so I wanted to know whether you've thought about extending your model uh, to um, possibly include transmission constraints to see what the effect would be um, and what do you anticipate the effect might be if you, if you did that. Oh, I totally agree with you that such models by definition have to be so simplified that um, that sometimes one worries uh, how, how much truth do they reflect. But, um, my, my, my feeling is that introducing transmission constraints um, could reshuffle the outcomes, but as long as the existence of constraints is not endogenous to the markets, it, will, um, not, it would not change the big thinking on, on how the subsidies affect the wholesale markets, but it could indeed change um, some of the results that I have. And namely, it could mean for, so now we, uh, I have those clean results where basically subsidies affect only very few prices uh, and via capacities of very few generators. And I believe with transmission constraints, uh, there would be more um, more resources that are directly affected. Um, I, I would have difficulty though pointing in which direction exactly this would go. I know that there is one study that introduces uh, transmission constraints to um, to to capacity and uh, subsidy mark uh, and subsidy settings. Um, so I, I bet I could get some intuition uh, from how they that. Yes, that's a good point. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Kira. Thanks, Sylvia. And then there is uh, one question from the audience, Rajesh Gupta, and he asks, are subsidies same as feeding tariffs and how are they determined uh, in the model? Uh, yes, so uh, feeding and tariffs for this overly simple, uh, simple model would also be a type of uh, generation subsidy. And in the model, the, the, the amount of generation subsidy is taken as um, given. Um, we, do not, we do not model uh, the actual values of, of subsidies. Uh, it's just a very abstract model that, um, um, uh, that yeah, stays um, 
on parameter, overrides over parameter values currently. But uh, we have a section where we um, model the current situation in PJM. Um, so we show there what, what would be an equilibrium married order according to our model um, in PJM. And one could actually try to uh, plug in the, the capacity, the generation subsidies that the PJM resources get to see what's happening there. Okay, great. Thanks again, Sylvia. And uh, uh, so now I will introduce our next thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, our next panelist, Rodney Kizoto. Uh, Rodney, you can share your screen now. Uh, Rodney is currently a PhD student at the University of Tennessee. And he graduated from the University of Pittsburgh in 2010 with a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering. He went on to earn a master's degree in industrial engineering from University of Arkansas in 2017 and is currently pursuing his PhD in industrial engineering at the University of Tennessee while working for the U.S. Department of Energy in the Research and Development Division. Uh, his paper today is the Cassie Optimization of Distributed Generator Location and Sizing an Island Utility Microgrid during a large-scale grid disturbance. All right, Ronnie, the floor is yours. Rodney, please unmute yourself. We might use Rebecca's help right now because I think she could unmute a participant remotely. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. A few little technical problems on this side. So we're good to go now. Um, thank you once again for that introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming through to these presentations. Um, as I said, my paper is focusing on um, applying stochastic optimization uh, to optimize the placement um, and sizing of distributed generators within a utility on microgrid. Um, it's written by myself, uh, Zayu. Um, Dr. Zhu Ping Li and Dr. Kai Sun, and we all hail from the good old University of Tennessee. So a quick run through of the agenda. Um, I'll discuss the motivation behind this microgrid research. Um, then I'll discuss the model that we developed, which optimizes the costs, efficiency, resilience, and reliability um, of an islanded utility on microgrid. Um, the microgrid we're modeling is being used to provide emergency power supply to critical public buildings within a city or town where a natural disaster has caused a prolonged outage on the main grid. Then I'll go over the results of the model and the conclusions gained from the results. So we'll start with the research motivation. Um, so the problem this research addresses pertains to the large scale grid blackouts experienced when unplanned natural disasters such as hurricanes, tornadoes, or earthquakes occur. So um, in such, such situations have become a lot more prevalent with recent examples such as Hurricane Sandy in 2012, Hurricane Florence in 2018, and Hurricane Laura, which recently just left so many without power in Louisiana. Um, and whether it's fair or not, the utility companies that service these affected areas usually receive the brunt of the negative public perception and regulatory pressure when such incidents occur. Um, so what our research proposes is the usage of microgrids um, by these utility companies to help provide disaster pow power relief um, during the extended blackouts. So the main focus of the microgrid is to ensure that the critical public facilities or buildings in the area, um, such as the hospitals, grocery stores, police stations, fire stations, and gas stations, have uninterrupted power supply throughout the duration of the power outage. Now this slide here shows three real life examples of microgrids used for grid resilience um, during this past 2010 decade. Um, on the left over there, the Sendai microgrid was used for disaster relief power supply um, when East Japan was hit with a deadly earthquake, which then caused a large tsunami to follow and led to about a 60% blackout in the city of Sendai. Um, the blackout lasted for about three days and they used this one megawatt microgrid um, to provide uninterrupted power supply to the critical loads in that area. And then the microgrid in the middle was opened in 2018 in Montgomery County, Maryland. That's actually where I'm from. Uh, Montgomery County has a history of extended blackouts happening during their hurricane season. 
so this microgrid was established to help the county better handle the extended power outages. And they used the microgrid to help ensure that the public safety headquarters, the Homeland Security Office, and the county's main police station can all remain powered when a hurricane hits the area and causes blackouts. Um, and then the third microgrid shown there is the fire stations in Fremont, California. Uh, so Fremont established that microgrid to show how microgrids can provide power to critical infrastructure, such as fire stations, um, while the microgrid is operating in island mode and disconnected from the main grid, which is what our model is based on as well. So now we'll move on to the optimization model. Uh, so this is an overview of how the model works. Um, so for the weather effects, the network that we use for the model is the greater Knoxville area that I currently live in. And I'm looking outside my window as I present to you guys right now. Um, so on average, Knoxville has about 97 sunny days, 107 cloudy days, and 161 overcast days. Um, the model captures how sunny, cloudy, and overcast days affect how much power the microgrids PV-based DGs can actually produce. And we use NREL's PV watts tool um, to estimate how much power production can be expected from the microgrid on sunny, cloudy, and overcast days. And then for the DGs and the CPBs, or the critical public buildings within the network, um, the capacity of the DGs and how much power each size of DG can output at each hour are all provided to the model as data. Um, and then the power demand of the critical, pu on the critical public buildings at each hour of the day is also provided to the model as data. Um, and then each of the critical public buildings in the grid network serves as a candidate location for what DG to be installed on or at the site. Um, so there's a total of 25 critical public buildings in the network that can all potentially have a DG installed at them if a utility has a budget to support that many. Um, so then for the operation of the microgrid, Recall that we're modeling a scenario where a widespread power outage has occurred due to some unplanned events such as a hurricane. Um, so in, these situ in this situation, the DGs are expected to supply power to the critical public buildings during the daytime when PV is available for generation. Um, and then the model analyzes each daytime hour separately from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and since these are critical public facilities, they're assumed to possess backup generators, which would then be providing power during the nighttime when there's no sunlight for PV generation. Um, so without the microgrid being available, the critical public buildings would be relying on the backup generators to provide power for the full 24 hours of the day for as many days as the outage actually lasts, which would of course overrun the backup generators and increase their chances of failure. So the combination of the microgrid and backup generators helps ensure that the critical public buildings do experience that uninterrupted power supply throughout the prolonged power outage. So now this image here shows the full design of the model um, with the objectives, decision variables, constraints, and solutions that the model produces. Um, so the decisions being made by the model are one, where to locate or install the DG systems within the grid network, two, what size and capacity the DG system should be, three, from the installed DG systems, the model decides which installed DG system supplies power to which building in the grid network, and then four, the last decision made is how many total DG systems are installed within the microgrid network. Um, so the constraints of the model ensure that the power flow equality at each node or site is followed by the microgrid. Um, then the power generation limits of the DGs are also ensured by the constraints. Um, the constraints also help ensure that the budget the utility provides uh, to establish the microgrid is respected by the model. Um, and then the effects of weather and time of day on the DG generation and the building demands uh, are also ensured by the constraints. Um, and then the model altogether optimizes a collection of five objectives that you see there in the purple box. And each objective is modeled as a separate cost function. So the five cost objectives are then added together to get the optimal solution of the model. And the model uses linear and stochastic pro programming techniques to minimize what this optimal solution would be. Um, so the first cost minimized here is the investment cost of the microgrid. Uh, then the second cost for minimizing the model is the operation and maintenance cost of the microgrid's installed DG systems. Then the third and fourth, the third, fourth, and fifth minimized costs are part of what make our research model unique. So for the third objective, this one minimizes the distance traveled for power supply. Uh, 
We modeled this in a way where the microgrid is penalized if uninstalled DG is supplying power to a building that is too far away from it. So one of the benefits of distributed renewable resources is that they can be located closer to the end user power consumer. So the model optimizes the distance power has to travel for distribution, which helps reduce how much power is lost through distribution um, and improves the distribution efficiency within the microgrid. So then the fourth objective minimizes how much power demand is left unmet within the grid network. Um, we applied a penalty cost to this objective where the power demand that isn't met uh, counts as a cost to the microgrid. So this forces the model to select enough DG systems with enough capacity to meet as much of the network power demand as possible while still remaining within the utilities provided budget. Then the fifth and last objective minimizes how much excess PV generation is pushed back into the grid. Um, this objective was added because we're considering utility scale solar generation here. And there's been more than enough research that shows that our grid as, as presently constructed isn't made to handle large amounts of reverse power flow. Um, so this fifth objective adds a penalty cost to the microgrid for any excess DG generated power that's pushed back into the grid. So this forces the model to select the optimal amount of DGs and the optimal amount of DG capacity to meet the demand of the buildings within the network without generating too much excess power. Uh, now we'll move on to the results and conclusions from the research. So the, these are the results of the model. Um, table one shows example solutions for a 10 and $15 million utility budget. Um, and then the box in yellow is a key for the results in table one. So as you see in table one, um, each increase in the unmet demand penalty from low to medium to high pushes the model to maximize more of the available budget and install more DGs and larger DG capacity into the microgrid. As a result of this, you, you can also see an increase in the network demand met at each hour or HNDM um, as the unmet demand penalty increases from low to medium to high. Um, so for example, at the low level, uh, the model installs only one DG at location 18, and that DG only gives the microgrid a capacity of 500 kilowatts, which is enough to only power up to 5% of the network demand, even on sunny days. Um, so this happened because the model found it cheaper to take on the low penalty cost for not meeting the power demand when the uh, than for the utility to install another larger or more expensive DG system into the microgrid. But then we now start to see more DGs are installed at the medium and high levels of the unmet demand penalty um, because at those levels, the model finds it cheaper to pay the expense of installing more DGs and larger DG capacity than it does to take on the higher unmet demand penalty costs that come with the medium level and high level penalty versus what was experienced at the low level. Um, so then a utility can ultimately look back at the solutions table and view all the possible solution outcomes based on the different budget options that the utility is able to provide and select the most optimal one. So the desire would be to select a solution that has one, a low optimal solution, two, a low HEPC or excess penetration cost at each hour, and three, high percentages of HNDM or network demand met at each hour. Um, and from the results in table one, the best microgrid solution is highlighted by that orange oval um, and has two five megawatt DGs at locations two and three within the grid network. Um, and such microgrid requires a budget of about $15 million to establish. So then this figure here shows the unmet demand results for the 10 and $15 million budget that we just saw on the previous slide at the medium level of the unmet demand cost penalty. Um, as expected, due to less sunlight availability, the cloudy and overcast days um, show much more unmet network demand than the sunny days across all the hours of the day. Um, but then on sunny days, the network demand can be fully met between the hours of 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. when the microgrid's DG output is more than enough to cover all the demand for the buildings during that time. But as the sun rises between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m., and sets between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m., you see that even on sunny days, the microgrids installed DGs are not able to meet all the network's demand. Um, so in conclusion, we designed the model to provide an optimal microgrid structure for a utility that's looking for 
uninterrupted power supply to critical public buildings in its service area after a natural disaster strikes and causes an outage. Um, the model provides justification for utilities to consider the investment into microgrids and renewable resources um, from an efficiency, resilience, and reliability standpoint that also takes into account the economic budget limitations of the utility company. Um, so we're still expanding the model and we're now going to add energy storage units to the microgrid. We expect the addition of energy storage to help reduce the excess penetration by storing that excess power instead. So that stored power can then be used to help meet the demand on cloudy and overcast days when the microgrid isn't generating as much power due to less sunlight availability. Um, and then the last thing we'll be adding will be time of use demand response strategies to see how demand shifting can help improve the overall demand coverage. And that's my presentation and I'll take any questions now. Great, thanks Ronnie. That was a very interesting presentation. Uh, we already have one judge raising his hand, uh, Dawood. Yeah, um, thanks Lucy. Uh, thanks Rodney for the very interesting presentation. Uh, I definitely enjoyed it. Um, I do have actually, let me rather call it two, two groups of questions. Um, the first of them, you eventually already addressed some points in your further steps part mm -hmm. in, the, in the end. Um, I was, so I, I should maybe say first, I'm, I'm personally coming from a rural electrification, from an energy access perspective when I talk about microgrids. Mm -hmm. um, so it might be a little different, but um, I, to me personally, the kind of microgrid that you use for modeling is quite idiosyncratic in a sense of you, you talk about a microgrid that just only run on PV at the same time, it does not have diesel generators. Um, so you completely exclude many, many options that one would naturally find to be the obviously better choice for, 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 for a mini grid. So given that, you're, that your mini grid doesn't have storage, given that you don't have dispatchable generators, um, asking provocatively, where exactly do you, do you see your results? Where do you see their impact? So, so what can you tell from, from your results given this very, very narrow uh, definition of a microgrid? Yeah. And the second one, um, more asking on your modeling part, uh, could you maybe identify precisely what's the new thing in your, in your model? So during the presentation, you eventually talked about the, uh, the distance traveled. Um, which, right, it's something I don't see that often, but I mean, in, in, in the end, you could, you could uh, implement the same thing with, say, for instance, um, um, uh, sorry, uh, by implementing losses. Um, you already said yourself, you're getting some issues from mixing the, the penalty function together with the real economic cost, so this is giving you some trouble. So, particularly from your modeling point of view, what's the unique thing about your study? Thank gotcha. you. Uh, so in response to the first one, um, so those, those generators, those backup diesel generators that you were talking about are an assumption in there because all of these are critical public facilities that we're looking at, right? So hospitals are more than likely going to have backup generators already installed. So the issue that comes up in such situations is if the outage is lasting four days, a lot of those backup generators are only set to last for about 72 hours before replenishment is necessary. Um, an, an example that was seen when Hurricane Sandy hit uh, the New York City area in 2012, there's a large hospital in Manhattan that had to be evacuated of 300 patients because those backup generators failed. And um, what we were proposing here is the combination now, if you're going to have those generators to use as, as nighttime power supply, when there is no sunlight available for PV generation, you can then rely on the PV generation during the daytime when there is sunlight available, which now ultimately can expand how long you have um, during that outage to provide power instead of just strictly relying on those diesel generators alone um, during the, the entire span of the outage. So the generators are assumed to be, an, uh, it's an assumption that all of these critical public facilities, which normally would have those things, um, actually do have them within the model. So then that allows us to focus on the 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. time frame when the sun is available for generation. And at that time frame, we're gonna use what the PV can generate um, to help provide that uninterrupted power supply. And then at nighttime, those backup diesel generators, which are assumed to be possessed by these um, critical public buildings already, would then kick in. Um, so it's part of it, but it's not directly part of our modeling because that's an assumption that the buildings already naturally have presently with or without the microgrid being added. Um, and then in regards to your, 
to your second group of questions. Um, so the third, fourth, and fifth, um, and fifth objective functions are part of what 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 made this unique, right? So it wasn't just the the distance traveled, which, like you said, is not one that that you that you see usually in literature, but the second one as well, um, incorporating the unmet demand, which helps to address things from a reliability standpoint and adding that penalty cost function, which is what, when you add the penalty cost at the low, medium, and high level, it then shows the flexibility that the model has where if let's say a utility only has $1 million they can give towards this budget, then it shows you what that looks like and what, how ultimately how much, how much cost it is to you as a utility for all the unmet demand you have within the network you're supposed to service. And you can see that at the low, medium, and high level. And what that cost function that's unique adds to it is it forces the model to then make, to then make sure that enough DG and DG capacity is added to meet the demand that's going on in the network at that time. So it's the application of those penalty cost functions for the unmet demand and the excess generation um, that ultimately add the uniqueness to how those objective functions are ultimately attained within the model. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Dao. Thank you, Rani. I guess I can ask the next question. Uh, this, this question is not really to the main model of your paper, but it's really to the uh, future research agenda that you laid out in your last slide. Mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, in the future, we can incorporate demand side, uh, demand side response into microgrid. I was wondering if just the microgrid itself can already uh, cause any behavior changes of the consumers that are uh, using the service from the microgrid. For example, are the consumers going to be notified that now their electricity is being supplied by the microgrid instead of the utility company? And if so, would that signal cause any change in the behavior, for example, any conservation behavior, because now they know that they're not connected to the grid? Yeah, so ultimately that's what you would, you would desire for, right? So since we're modeling a situation where, um, where the large scale disturbance has already occurred, right? And it's almost operating in island mode at this point, um, being able to add uh, demand response strategies that maybe let's say for the, if I use the hospital, for example, again, um, and you know that we have the most power production available for us between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. because that's when sunlight is going to be strongest. So maybe we can switch uh, the majority of the of the of the procedures we were going to be doing, whatever surgeries were going to be happening at that time, whatever thing that was going to be consuming so much power that was going to be happening, and move that towards the block of time that actually does have the most power being provided versus scheduling it for let's say 8 p.m. when that's at nighttime and all that you're that you're relying on is the backup generators, or 7 a.m. in the morning when it's not as much sunlight being generated. So being able to have that on some type of schedule um, is can ultimately help with any one of those five um, five types of critical public buildings in that moment. Got it. So I guess my question is, even without the actual demand side management program in mm -hmm. place, mm -hmm. will there be any behavior change already? Because now the consumers know that they're on microgrid. Oh, um, oh. So so without that being added in there, yes, it right. it, it could change already. Um, but the situation here is since this is a utility owned microgrid and it's at a moment where let's say the, this, this distribution section doesn't have any other power coming in except the power that's generating directly from the utility owned microgrid. So, um, power won't be available at that moment unless there's some type of PV generation that's coming on in. So though that could change in a normal setting, in the situation, the setting that we've confined the research down to, it being one where the large scale disturbance has already occurred, you wouldn't see that happening here. But in a normal time situation where the utility is operating or the utility grid is operating normally and the microgrid is operating normally, then there could be that change that you're discussing. Great. Uh, my, so if there are any, no other judges having question, uh, please allow me to ask another question. Uh, so that in your current model, the financing mode is through you, uh, basic utility is paying for all the costs of uh, building the microgrid. Just out of curiosity, what are some other financing options for building a microgrid? Because currently we know that your model, if the penalty for uh, no electricity connection is low, then utility will not build the, um, build the microgrid. But then we know that those uh, public buildings, the critical buildings that are providing very critical service. So I'm just curious. 
are there any other financing options for building microgrid? Gotcha. Um, so as far as what other financing options they would have, um, I'm not, uh, I guess that's not really my, in my scope of understanding from what, what a utility manager would be looking for. What I do know and understand is that's a situation that utility managers and utilities in general do face when those kind of disturbances do occur and they're not able to provide the power because some, some power poles, some transmission lines were knocked out that now uh, during the transmission and that now affect the distribution side of things. And ultimately, the negative pressure that they receive as a result of that and the, the brunt of the negative public perception that they get as a result of that um, is, is the fire that the utilities come under in that situation. So what the model was trying to do is at least build a case and provide justification for why movement towards um, incorporating microgrids in the utilities uh, already um, given operations would be beneficial to them in moments where these unexpected disasters do occur. Um, as far as how the financing for that would go, uh, you'd have to ask somebody who's a utility manager, they may know better for that. But I did try to incorporate the budgetary limitations that I know the utility would have um, going through the options of a one, 10 and $15 million budget option. Great, thank you, Rodney. Yes, Thanks, very interesting. All right, so now it's time for our third uh, finalist, uh, Stephen Chavez, who is now a PhD student at the Energy and Resources Group and has uh, an energy institute at Haas at Berkeley. And um, his research interests are centered on energy and environmental economics with a focus on applied econometrics and machine learning methods. And before he came to Berkeley, uh, he, um, he came to Berkeley after three years working for Ofgem, the UK's energy regulator. And before that, he studied at the London School of Economics. His paper today is the economic cost of nimbinism, evidence from renewable energy projects. All right, Stefan, the floor uh, is yours. Perfect. Um, thanks very much. And thanks for having me. Hopefully you can hear me okay, and, uh, but interrupt me if you don't. My internet's not doing great today. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to talk today about the economic cost of nimbyism um, and looking at renewable energy projects in particular. Um, and so to sort of build on what Rodney was talking about, about solving for like an optimal investment strategy, what I'm going to look at here is there's a political process that decides what we actually build. Um, and I'm going to look at the potential costs that that imposes. Um, so nimbyism, hopefully people have heard of this, but these sort of not in my backyard attitudes have a big impact on uh, many sort of societal issues where we have to build new stuff um, from housing. I'm in mean, the Bay Area, prices are high, and this is one of the reasons they often get cited. Um, but also in the climate space, this comes up a lot. Um, so here's a particularly inflammatory article from Bloomberg, for, for instance, um, looking at how local residents opposing renewable energy projects is becoming a big issue. Um, in getting these things approved and over the line. And we're gonna to have to build a lot of these in the future to meet a lot of uh, ambitious climate goals. Um, so here I'm gonna look at renewable energy and look at this problem of, of nimbyism and try and get at some of the economic costs at play here. And I'm gonna use the UK as a case study uh, in large part because they have a very detailed database of all the projects that were proposed for planning permission. And so that includes projects that got built, but also ones that didn't. So you can sort of see the path not taken. Uh, and here I'm going to try and answer two key questions. First, just what are the local impacts, the local economic costs these projects might impose on local residents? And then second, how are those factored into the approval process that tells us what gets built? So the rough kind of outline here is I'm going to give some background and then just answer these two questions. So for a bit of background, um, wind and solar projects, I'm sure are all pretty familiar with these things, but they're essentially taking big industrial uh, pieces of kit like wind turbines and putting them in places that we haven't traditionally put these things and often they can still be close to where people live. This is a wind farm in Scotland in the UK and this is a solar farm in the south of England and so this should give you a sense of the kind of projects I'm thinking of here. So the database that I'm drawing on is this database of all the planning applications for renewable energy projects in the UK since the 90s and here you can see on the left is solar projects um, primarily located in the south of the country and on the right is wind projects and in green are the ones that got approved and red are the ones that got denied. And so, and this just shows you over time when they were built, um, 
solar projects are mostly later in the period and there's much more wind projects or at least in terms of their size. And just for, this is some brief summary statistics. The key thing I want you to take away from here is there's about 3,500 projects over this period. Wind projects tend to be larger. And basically the planning process is way harder for wind projects. It takes three to four times longer for them to get approved. And they're only approved about 40% of the time, whereas solar projects is sort of 70, 75% of the time, which you can see here with this kind of initial decision approval rate. So what this kind of tells us is clearly the planning process is a lot harder on wind projects and potentially local residents don't like them as much. And a key reason might be that they impose some real larger costs on local residents, maybe in terms of spoiling the view uh, of nearby properties, there's noise from the turbines, um, whereas solar panels are maybe less kind of visually intrusive. Um, so this is something that's come through in, in the news a lot, both here in the US, but also in the UK where I'm gonna be studying this. And so first I'm just gonna try and get at some measure of how big these local impacts are. So to do this, so this is Lancaster in the north of England, which is where I grew up. Um, and essentially what I'm gonna do is collect a bunch of data on commercial property values, and that's gonna be at these kind of census tract blocks. And then a bunch of data on residential property values, which is gonna be at these zip codes, essentially. And then there's a bunch of wind projects and solar projects in this area. The wind ones are in green, the solar projects are in orange. And taking this one wind project over here, I'm just gonna do a sort of difference in differences setup, um, a regression analysis to look at how do property values change for properties that are located near a project versus further away before and after a project gets built and look at what those changes in property values are. And this is gonna be one way for me to get some sense of the market value, the dollar value of these impacts being imposed on local communities by building a project. This is just a more formal way of putting down what I've just said in sort of nice image form. This is just the sort of regression equation I'm gonna be estimating here. But the key thing I want you to take away is I'm gonna look at how do these effects vary as you get closer to a project, the distance, and then obviously before and after the project gets built, and then some measure of the size of a project. We might think that large projects have more impacts than small ones. And so I'm gonna capture this using the capacity of a project and just sort of show that a very big project is, should probably have a larger impact on local residents than one that just has one or two turbines or solar panels or something. Okay. So, so what do I end up finding here? Um, so this is just to walk you through, this is, the, this is the impact of a wind project on residential property values. And so on the x-axis is the sort of years relative to when the project got built and that black line is when it was actually built. Um, and then on the y-axis is the percentage change in the property values nearby. And then these colors represent how close you are to the project. So red is you're really close, sort of not two kilometers, all the way out to blue, you're like pretty far away. And the key thing that hopefully you can take away here is for those properties that are pretty close by, the moment the project gets built, you see this negative effect on their property values, a sort of four to 5% reduction in property values for um, for those located a sort of north two kilometers away. And the effects aren't as pronounced for um, properties that are further away. Um, and then just very briefly, there's a sort of dotted line here that shows the impact on properties that were near a project that was proposed but didn't get built. And you can actually see a sort of appreciation here. They actually go up a little bit, which might be a sort of interesting example of sorting behavior. So this is for residential property values and wind projects. Um, I also look at solar projects and don't really find much of an effect with fits with at least my prior on these. And then I try to look at commercial property values as well. We might think there might be impacts on tourism or something like that um, from building one of these projects. And a real challenge here is just the data is not as good. There might be some evidence of a negative effect from, from wind projects, but it's, I, it's difficult to really pick it out. And this is something I want to work on further. Um, and again, I don't really find too much on solar projects. So what I'm seeing here is wind projects do impose real negative costs on local communities, at least measured in terms of their impact on property values. Solar projects, less so. So what I'm gonna do with this is sort of take these estimates from the first part, use them as a measure of these local costs and see 
how is that factored into the planning process? How does that affect what gets built and what doesn't? And so the key approach here is I'm going to do this in kind of three stages to tackle sort of three things that I was interested mm. in on this issue. Um, so essentially, um, the first one is just how big are these local costs? Are they big or are they small relative to some of the other costs and benefits, which are why we're doing these projects in the first place. So using the, my estimates of the impact on local property values, I'm then just going to compare them to all the other stuff that would go into like a net present value calculation for one of these renewable energy projects. Um, the second part is then do an analysis to look at when something gets approved, what are local decision makers more sensitive to? Local factors or these other things to do with carbon emissions benefits or the costs of build, building the project. And then finally, I'm going to look at if there, if there is undue weight or a lot of weight given to these local factors, which is what I think is going to happen and what does in fact appear to be the case, what cost does this impose on society as a whole in terms of misallocated investment? So what do I find here? So first, this is just to give you a sense of the costs and benefits and how big these local costs are relative to the other reasons we're doing these projects. So the key one maybe to focus on here is the solar project, uh, the wind projects on the right. And you can see the kind of things you might expect, a sort of declining cost of building these projects over time, um, and also a declining sort of emissions benefit from building them. A project built in the 90s displaced a lot of coal, but a project built in the 2020s, not so much. The, the grid is already a lot cleaner. And in orange, you can see these local impacts, how big they are. And they're roughly of the same size as the sort of operating costs of these projects over their lifetime. So not trivial, but also not massive. Um, but nonetheless, there's a lot of heterogeneity here. So this is just showing you over time. But if I just rank all the projects as I've done here, you can see some have very big local costs and some have none at all, which makes sense. So what I'm going to now get, try, what I want, really want to know is how are these factors weighted when, when we're making a decision whether to approve this by sort of the local county officials who have control over the process, which things are they most sensitive to? Um, and this you can see here in the second part, essentially, as we might fully expect, they're much more sensitive to these local impacts on local property values. These decisions are primarily made by local county officials. Um, and so to avoid sort of 10 million pounds worth of property value losses, um, they're pretty sensitive to that. If they can do that, then they're sort of 2% more likely to approve a project. But for the same sort of change in maybe sort of lower capital costs or a greater value of the electricity being produced, they're sort of not really responsive to that, even at the same sort of value. So I thought that's, that was quite interesting to see. And this is more pronounced in conservative areas and when the decision maker is indeed a local county official. What this tells us is there might be a lot of misallocated investment going on here. There might be real costs being imposed of local officials denying beneficial projects in favor of ones that are more remote, um, further away from population centers that they're less sort of bothered about. And when I try and put a number on what those costs are from that misallocated investment, I find they're pretty big, um, sort of six to 18 billion pounds for the wind projects built over this time period, which is a sort of eight to 23% increase in the costs of providing the renewable energy that the UK has built over this time period. For solar projects, not much distortion, which fits with the fact that these don't impose big local costs. And the key thing that this suggests to me is that there's, there's real potential benefit from having some sort of policies that can provide transfers that help mitigate these costs for local communities um, and help get more beneficial projects over the line. Um, so that's something that I wanna keep looking at in the future. Um, so yeah, that's everything I've got here. I've had to glaze over a lot, but hopefully um, there's some, some great questions. I look forward to getting your feedback. Hey, uh, thanks, Stephen. Uh, that was a great presentation. Uh, we already have two judges raising their hand. Uh, uh, Anna, you, uh, why don't you go first? Thank you, Lucy. Uh, Stephen, thank you for this excellent presentation and for really interesting insights. I would like to go back to one of the earlier slides of yours that uh, is showing how property values react, uh, reacted 
to um, wind project being built. And one of the graphs you've shown, uh, there is a dip, there is this initial dip and a slight uptake at what I can estimate exactly uh, even earlier, I would say after two or three years. Um, yep. And uh, is there a time lag effect that you accounted for where property values um, are rebounding back after the owners or the market are more used to the line of sight of such projects? And there's anecdotal evidence that after wind turbines are built, the residents become increasingly amicable to them. And as an example, Paris residents also hated the Eiffel Tower when it was built, but it gradually came, they gradually came to love it. So how do you see or can imagine similar effects playing out in your study? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And that when I presented this before, I've had a similar thing asked, because I think at the moment I'm just treating this as a sort of four to five percent reduction and it's permanent. But if it's this is only a temporary thing, then maybe this isn't as big of an issue um, as it might initially be perceived by the local residents. So it's a great point. And I think at the moment, I just sort of set it up with sort of four to five years of this after period to get a sense of when the, of the full effect being realized. But yeah, if there is this sort of regression back to the mean, I think um, what I'd like to do is ex try and extend this analysis and just have a, like a longer period after the fact and see if that does in fact happen. Um, it's not something I've done yet, but it's definitely something I want to do in the future. And as, as sort of more and more time passes from when these are, when, at least when the early projects are built, it becomes more and more feasible to do that. So it's on my to-do list, it's a great point. And I think that might change, it might still matter for the political process in terms of residents are annoyed now when you're making the decision, but it might change the calculus on what we think, on what we think the sort of best solution is. So yeah, thanks, that's, that's a great question. Thanks, Anna, thanks, Stephen. Um, Dawu, I saw that your hand is still raising. I'm assuming yeah. you have questions. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, first things first, eventually most people from Paris whom I know, they eventually still hate the Eiffel Tower. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, thank you for the very interesting presentation. And do you have two smaller questions? One of them a moderate question. Could you, could you maybe go to the slide on um, uh, uh, commercial properties and wind? So just two, two I think it's two more. Yeah, eventually that one. Um, okay. So probably you've already thought about it. So um, what could be the reason why we see such a strong coefficient uh, on the on, on the closed object, still such an insanely large um, uh, area of confidence? Um, it's just literally the data too bad, or would you say that whatever there is, there is another process going on in the background. So what's your main explanation to, uh, for that? Because so my, yeah. my initial guess would be, just, just maybe to provide that, my initial guess or, or my, my, my intuition would be, Particularly when, talk, when we're talking commercial areas, um, they should act. We would expect uh, the response to be far lower than the response than the response for uh, for residential buildings. Uh, because, mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously. Uh, second question, um, just so you have both, um, how would you translate that into into policy? So from an, from an evaluation perspective, just as you said, it's quite clear. So we can get a very good idea of where investments might go wrong. Uh, but from another point of view, um, if you really want to, if you were really to put this into the policy process, so these estimations eventually, wouldn't you start to create some kind of moral hazard? So wouldn't, wouldn't you start to create incentives for people, for local councils to eventually um, misuse any kind of compensation payment that one could um, see as, as a conclusion of your research? Thanks. Yeah. Um, so just on the on the first question. Yeah, I think my sense is this is two things are going on. One is commercial properties is very heterogeneous, right? There's many different commercial uses. Um, and so picking out the ones that should or should not be affected here is one of the things that might make it noisier than it might other be, otherwise be the case. But I think the other one is this data is just quite limited. The re residential stuff is at the individual property level. And it's a huge data set of like, 24 million property transactions, whereas the commercial stuff is these sort of regional like annual averages. And so what I'd really love to do is get hold of the raw property data, the commercial property data that underlies that. And it's sort of, I'm waiting for them to approve it and send it to me. And then hopefully I can pick out, okay, this is the 
10,000 hotels that are near projects and then look at specific uses that might actually be affected. So I think that's my understanding of, of the, the real challenge in, in this part of the analysis. And then to your, to your second question about um, sort of policy responses and avoiding moral hazard and things like that. I think, yeah, it's, it's totally spot on. And I think there are, there are definitely risks in this area. Um, some of the main policy solutions that I've seen proposed, and they sort of fit with this idea of making some sort of Carrillo improving transfers or to have like a community benefits fund where the developer of the project pays some money to the local community um, to either directly to local residents in like a discount on their bills um, or to some sort of local community center or something like that. So you see a lot of those, but they're very, they're not, they're all voluntary and they're very sort of heterogeneous and you're not entirely sure um, how informed either the local community is or the developer is about that negotiation, negotiating process. But I, hopefully you, you would think that a policy like that with a bit more support and maybe a bit more formalization around it could try and offset some of these issues and do it in a way that leads to gains for both parties. And maybe that could also avoid some of these moral hazard issues as well, rather than sort of mandating it, making it something that is negotiated on a case by case basis. So that's my rough sense of it, but um, there's, there's a lot that's it's like an evolving area and something I want to look at further. Thank you. Great, thanks Dawood. Thank you, uh, Stefan. And next, Kiara. Thank you, Lucy, and thank you, Stephen. This was a great presentation. I, I really enjoyed it. Could you go back to the last uh, slide that you showed us, the one where you had the, yeah, here. So this is this just the, yeah, thank you. So I was, um, I, I, I was very surprised by the um, um, sort of magnitude of costs um, yep. in terms of misallocated investment that, that you find, mm -hmm. that especially like the difference between the cost associated with wind projects as opposed to solar projects that, I mean, the difference is striking. And so I was wondering if you could tell us a little more about the way in which you calculated these costs, you could give us a little more insights into, into that. For sure, in fact, I might have a chart here. Okay, so the basic idea here is I've got this big data set of sort of 3,500 projects that were proposed and a subset of those were actually built, right? Um, and for each project to do the analysis, and you saw it in the costs and benefits stuff that I saw before, I calculated the local costs and then all the other costs and benefits of each project that would go into a, like a regular cost benefit analysis. And so from that, I can come up with some sense of like which projects have a high net present value and which ones have a low net present value. And in some ideal world, I think we would expect that the sort of least cost projects get built. But in reality, that's almost certainly not the case. Um, the ones that do get approved might be actually more expensive from a societal perspective than some of these other candidate projects that were denied. And so that was what I wanted to do here. So for each year, um, I looked at how much wind capacity or, or wind energy came online in that year. Um, maybe there's sort of five gigawatts of, of, of new wind comes online, look at the ones that got built and then look at other projects that could have come online in that same year. And if they were lower cost, what would be the benefits from switching to those other projects? And that's where this gap comes from. I think the reason the gap gets so large is primarily for wind projects. There's been a huge bias in the UK to building projects in either remote locations like way up in the north of the country so they're a long way from population centers and have much higher transmission transmission costs um, or building them like even like fully offshore which has big costs as well um, and so i think that's where this big wedge comes from there's a lot of projects that were proposed that are sort of onshore closer to population centers that were just being systematically refused even though sort of from a societal perspective they would have been cheaper to build so that's where this kind of wedge comes from. Um, and that was that that's where this sort of six to 18 billion, billion comes from. Does, does that answer your question? Or I, if you have a follow up, I'm happy to talk about it further. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kiara. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, Stefan, we do have one open question in the Q&A box. If you have time, you can uh, directly answer there. And due to the time constraint, we won't be able to do that live here. All okay. Right, so, no. uh, yeah. Okay, thanks again. So our Thank you. 
Last finalist, uh, Amanda Harker Steele. Uh, Dr. Harker Steele works as an economist for Key Logic Systems, supporting the Systems Engineering and Analysis Directorate at the U.S. Department of Energy's National uh, Energy Technology Lab. And in her current role, she utilizes economic theory and empirical method methods to analyze the economic impacts of R&D being conducted by the National Lab. And her research focuses on the development and deployment of carbon capture technologies, electricity market infrastructure changes, coal markets, and demand response for natural gas. And her paper today is modeling disruptions in power system reliability using a state contingent production function approach. All right, and Amanda, the floor is yours. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Lucy, for that introduction. Um, so this is joint work with two of my co-authors. Uh, one being Dr. Bergstrom from UGA, the other being Dr. Wesley Burnett from the College of Charleston, where we're looking to use a state contingent production function approach to model disruptions in power system reliability. Um, just to kind of give a... Okay. So since the early 1900s, electricity in the United States has been predominantly supplied by conventional fossil fuels, including coal, oil, and natural gas. And although these fossil fuels still dominate the market, consistently accounting for over 50% of domestic electricity generation, there's been much public concern about the negative environmental impacts associated with utilizing these resources. And as a result of this concern, attempts to decarbonize the electric utility industry through increased utilization of wind and solar have really expanded across the United States. An underexplored implication of this transition, however, is whether or not it impacts the uh, power system reliability in a negative way. So unlike traditional fossil fuels, in the absence of energy storage solutions, the contribution that wind and solar can make to the grid depends on the weather, which changes frequently throughout the day. And as, we've, as you can see in figure two, which depicts California's load curve, otherwise known as the duck curve, Ideal conditions for these two resources, especially solar, don't necessarily align with peak system demand. So noting the need to more clearly understand the reliability implications of utilizing these resources, the objective of this paper is to both theoretically and empirically examine whether or not increasing generation from wind and solar and utility scale generation in, in particular influences the frequency or duration of power system disruptions experienced by end consumers. So our results, just to give you a preview, do suggest that wind and solar have a significant positive impact on the frequency and duration of power system disruptions experienced. However, only at low levels of net generation being supplied by these two resources. As net generation from wind and solar increases, the frequency and duration of power system disruptions decrease, suggesting they're really decreasing economies of scale to net generation being supplied by wind and solar. So the, as most of us know, um, the electricity provided to end consumers from their electric utility is typically produced from multiple different types of generating units. The generating units chosen depend both on the cost of the generating units and, the op and their operational capabilities, as well as the cost and the operational capabilities on this, of the system in which they operate. So when we think about the choice to choose specific units, um, they're being committed based on these costs and operational capabilities, but once they're committed they, to produce electricity, they provide a solution to what is called the unit commitment problem. And this process takes place at least 24 hours in advance of the need to meet actual demand. And the troubling consequence of having solved this unit commitment problem in advance of actual operations is the future state of the world is not necessarily known to the power system operator. It's at best predicted. So in the absence of an energy storage solution, if wind and solar are scheduled to be part of the unit order of dispatch, and those resources are not available as expected, following a traditional power grid system where an electricity flows in one direction from generation to end consumer, a resulting um, disruption may be experienced from their use. So to model this theoretically, we follow the literature and assume that the objective of an electric utility is to maximize its expected profit subject to the production of electricity, which is assumed to be produced using, oh, sorry, um, three inputs, capital technology inputs labeled as K, labor inputs labeled as L, and energy resource inputs labeled as R. 
a power system operator or utility can choose multiple different types of energy resources to meet demand or to produce electricity. We consider, we kind of divide them into four categories and we focus on R4, which is used to represent non-dispatchable or non-storable flow resources, or for example, wind and solar. When deciding upon the resources it would like to use to generate electricity, because it's operating under this traditional power grid system, the power system operator also has to consider the probability of a random state of nature S revealing itself in the future. So for ease of exposi exposition and without loss of any generality, we consider only two states of nature uh, faced by this power system operator. Under state of nature S equals one, meteorological conditions for wind and solar, also known as in intermittent renewables, are favorable or as expected. Under state of nature S equals two, meteorological conditions for these resources are not favorable or as expected. In the event that the power system operator has scheduled wind and solar to be part of its unit order of dispatch and state of nature S equals two reveals itself in the future, we see that production of electricity actually resulting in a power system outage. So to conduct our empirical analysis, we collect data from two annual surveys administered by the US Energy Information Administration. After matching the data uh, by operator ID, we end up with about 276 observations or for individual electric utilities and five, across five years, resulting in an unbalanced panel data set. So there are many different definitions of power system reliability available in the literature. Um, for the purposes of this study, we assume that reliability is defined as the ability of elect an electrical generating system to meet in-system demand. So we use two indices collected um, or developed by the Institute of Elect Electrical and Electronic Engineers, SADE and SAFE. Information um, on these two indices was actually collected from EIA survey form 861, and they have been available since 2013, which explains kind of the length of our data set. So before uh, we use these as our measure of power system outages, we transform both indices using an inverse hyperbolic sign transformation because this allows us to interpret our coefficients of interest or our parameters of interest as semi-elasticities. It also results in a relatively normal distribution for our um, dependent variable. And it allows us to maintain our excess zeros, which is important. Um, an, another paper of this looks at a log transformation, which is also applied and results are consistent. So our empirical model takes the following form. Our primary variables of interest are WPV prime, which is an indicator variable equal to one. If the utility identifies either wind or solar as a prime mover for at least one of the power plants they use to generate electricity, WPV is the amount of net generation being supplied by wind and solar each year. And then to capture the potential decreasing marginal effect of net generation from wind and solar, we include the squared term. We control for year fixed effects and also unobserved individual effects. We include a vector XIT of observ observable variables that are believed to influence power system outages experienced by utilities. Uh, we Given the kind of panel nature of our data, we estimate our model um, using a random effects model specification. And we do that for two reasons. One, uh, following the results of the Hausman test, uh, the random effects model is superior to fixed effects. And there are also some time invariant unobservable variables that are of interest to us, including the NERC region that the utility operates in, as well as its ownership structure. So if, inc if increasing the amount of net generation being supplied from wind and solar is known to lead to longer or more frequent power system disruptions then utilities who experience longer or more frequent power system disruptions already may be less likely to install wind and solar to meet their electricity needs so given this kind of potential endogenous relationship we employ an instrument of variables approach to estimate our model we follow um, recent literature from johnson and oliver in 2019 and utilize various aspects of a state's policy support for generation from renewable energy resources as our primary choice of instrumentation. So um, what we do, we estimate this by a two-stage least squares approach. Um, our two policy support variables of interest include whether or not there's an RPS requirement in place, and if so, 
what the incremental increase in that RPS requirement is over the length of our study. We also have the renewable electricity production tax credit, which we apply to each of the utilities and calculate based on the amount of net generation they report being supplied from wind and solar. We actually have two uh, first stage estimating equations, but I've listed one because they're identical to each other with the exception of WPV being the dependent variable here and WPV being the deep, deep squared being the dependent variable in the other one and ZIT being our vector of instrumental variables. We also include that as a squared term for our other first stage estimation equation. You can see from table one that our um, results or our estimates do a pretty good job of explaining this variation. Um, you'll notice that the RPS requirement squared for the squared um, first stage equation is not significant, but because we only have one endogenous variable, we own, or one endogenous variable, we really only need one exogenous variable across both equations, so the rank and order conditions are still satisfied. So our results are labeled here in table two. Um, we estimate the model by both OLS and instrumental variables, and we find that there are really decreasing economies of scale to net generation from wind and solar. Um, the frequency or, and duration of disruptions will decrease as net generation from these resources increase, which is important to note because as the policy um, moves forward, such as an RPS requirement, and we start to transition to an economy that relies more heavily on wind and solar, what we're finding is that as these utilities are increasing their generation from these resources, maybe they're able to or have the technology available to account for them they're more able to predict their contribution, and thus we may not have these reliability implications as we transition. We also find results that are consistent with other findings in the literature that have looked at um, SADI and SAFI before. Our results are robust across um, various model specifications, but I think it's important that we talk a little bit more in depth about the policy implications of these conclusions. So really, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's really much concern over in the United States and across the world of, about the environmental effects of greenhouse gas emissions from burning fossil fuels. So following an incentive-based policy approach, federal and state governments can and do provide economic subsidies to utilities to encourage increased power generation from wind, solar, and other types of renewables. And following a direct regulation approach, state and local governments are imposing standards on utilities, which require that they generate power using uh, mandated percentages of wind and solar. But, and while these policies you know, benefit power customers in society by reducing harmful environmental effects, as we show in, these study, in this study, these policies don't come out with no costs. They do impose some costs on utility customers in the form of power system outages and as we heard earlier, these kind of critical facilities and infrastructures that rely on a consistent supply of power, they could be harmed in, an, in a very difficult or discerning way when renewables start to displace more, more uh, traditional generation. But it's important to note that this, this work is not without its own limitations. So storage technology options definitely need to be embedded in our empirical analysis and our theoretical model. Um, we also only consider behind the meter contributions to the grid. So we don't consider, um, or no, we consider utility scale. We need to consider behind the meter contributions to the grid. And we have plans to do that in the future. We also um, ha only have five years of data right now. We've been waiting on the data to be updated from the EIA. And luckily we have one uh, an additional year of data 2018 available to us now. And we're exploring the idea of storage to see how it might influence our results and help us kind of discern a little bit more about our theoretical model and tie it directly to our empirical justification. So I'm open to questions and of course, any comments. All right, thanks Amanda. That was very interesting presentation. Okay, so Anna, uh, why don't you go first? Thank you, it seems uh, that I have a lot of questions today. So um, I'm glad you pointed out uh, storage uh, towards the very end of this uh, presentation. It has been missing from the discussion and um, you were mentioning, oh, if there was only a technology that would help with the intermittency problem and we do have this technology. So I, I applaud your plan to 
expand uh, this analysis uh, and integrate some energy storage solutions because if you look even at uh, some policy objectives, a lot of states and a lot of utilities are thinking about storage. So this, this might change some of the implications uh, from your study. But um, the modeling aside, um, based on international experience, uh, a lot of European grids are able to function with much, much higher renewable penetrations without experiencing blackouts or intermittency problems. Uh, what is that they're doing that the US markets are not doing? And feel free to take more of a bird eye view approach. I feel like I have a cognitive dissonance uh, with this um, view that increased uh, penetration of renewables necessarily brings about uh, service disruptions because um, we haven't witnessed that in some economies. Yeah, I, I would uh, um, welcome that question and appreciate it. Um, so we started this paper, I think, I think five or six years ago. And really the motivation for it was we were seeing these large scale installations of wind farms in Germany. Um, and we found several reports, I think they were dated in 2013, where there was almost too much wind on the grid. So the power system outage was not necessarily an inadequacy problem, but an oversupply problem. So that's really the only um, area that I'm familiar with, but we also see um, more and more international um, individuals and countries looking and planning these projects in advance and kind of determining whether or not they fit into their grid. Um, so I, I'm not necessarily sure what they're doing better than the US um, at this point, but I think that we can learn from each other. Okay, thanks Anna, thanks Amanda. And then uh, next, Kiara. Thank you, thank you Amanda. This was, a, this was an interesting, interesting paper and interesting presentation. I have a question about your empirical model and specifically the uh, variable WPVIT. Um, and of course you have a square term, but I think we can focus on, the, on, on, the, on this one. And if I understand correctly, WPV represents the amount of net generation that is supplied by wind and solar but that is reported by the utility, right? So you get the data from the EIA 923, you look at how much power generation comes from wind and solar from that utility and you use that as one of your, one of your controls. And so my, my question is as follows, oftentimes, especially in parts of the United States where electricity markets have been restructured, these utilities really do not operate as islands, right? They are uh, they operate in the in the context of uh, sometimes very large regional electricity markets, and um, electric flows are very interdependent. So it's generally not possible to identify the source of electricity that is consumed at a given point um, in in the grid. And so my question to you is whether um, you thought of the possibility that disruptions in power system reliability, which is really your, your left-hand side variable, if you wish, those disruptions may be related to renewable capacity and renewable generation that comes from elsewhere in the grid. And so you may not be accounting for that because you're only really looking at wind and solar generation that is supplied by that particular utility. Have you thought about this and um, have, you, have you considered ways to address this, this potential issue in your empirical model? Thank you uh, for that question. I, I have thought about it, but I have not come up with a way to specifically address it. Um, so when we looked at the data, what we did is we we matched them by operator ID. So we were assuming that the power plants that that utility owns or operates are contributing to the generation that it's supplying elsewhere. But we didn't have a way to control for electricity that it might be buying that would be sourced from renewables that could be influencing the disruptions. Um, but something that we did do um, that I failed to point out earlier is we did control for um, the effects of weather. Uh, so we 
separated our outages from outages that occurred on what are referred to as major event days versus non-major event days to kind of control for some of that variability in the weather impacts. But we were not able to account for the, the non-island nature of the electrical grid system, which I think is an important point. And whenever we're building up the theoretical model for this, we're assuming that the utility has complete control over every generating resource that it utilizes, whereas in some cases it's buying that necessary, necessary electricity. So I think that we're looking to really expand that model to kind of figure out, okay, what are, what hypothetically and theoretically should these relationships look like? And how can we gather more data to tell that story? I think that would be important. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you for the question. All right. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Kiara. And then that brings us to the end of this webinar. Uh, I want to congratulate all four finalists again for being selected into the final comp uh, computation. And I want to thank uh, every finalist for the high quality of your work that has made this event a success. And I also want to uh, thank uh, our, our judges for spending the time to read the paper and provide very helpful comments and, and for generating the excellent discussions today. Um, all right, so uh, uh, Rebecca, do you have any other uh, final words to, before we conclude our session today? I do. USAEE wishes to thank Dr. Lucy Chu, our student teams, and distinguished judges for an outstanding webinar. This webinar will be available on USAEE's website for future download. If you're not a member of USAEE, we encourage you to join by visiting www.usaee.org. We thank you for attending, and I now officially close this webinar.